It seems that the rich men north of Richmond have taken note that their constituents feel that housing prices are too high and that, by darn it, they're going to do something about it. That's why they released two pieces of legislation to deal with these greedy hedge funds driving up housing values. The two bills attacked the same route, but went at it in a different way. You have the End Hedge Fund Control of American Homes Act of 2023, and then there's the American Neighborhoods Protection Act. It's so cute how they come up with these names. If you don't think that a name or title matters, then go take a look at past legislation that Washington has passed. If, and that's an enormous if, but if one of these bills were to be passed, then would it actually do anything? Let's take a look. But real quick, my name is Jeff Chubb, I'm a retired investment banker turned real estate agent. I've sold more than a thousand houses. If you have any real estate questions, then no, I am here to help. We all know the deal. Affordability challenges have made it so that a lot of Americans can't achieve the American dream of home ownership. But don't worry, the federal government is here to help. It makes sense because, as we've discussed in a previous video, they are the majority of the reason as to why home ownership is out of reach for so many Americans. But let's talk about the Ed Hedge Fund Control Act first. This bill would ban the hedge funds from owning single-family houses and require them to sell at least 10% of the total number of single-family houses that they currently own per year to families over a 10-year period. After that 10-year period, hedge funds would be completely banned from owning any single-family properties. Now, naturally, they have to throw in tax penalties like $50,000 per single-family home per year tax penalty or imposing a 50% tax on the fair market value of any future hedge fund purchase. Oh, and the government would then use this tax revenue to go towards down payment assistance programs. We will break all of this down momentarily, but first let's take a look at what the American Neighborhoods Protection Act is all about. Now, this bill would require corporations that own more than 75 single-family residents to pay $10,000 per home annually into a housing trust fund to provide down payment assistance grants to families purchasing single-family homes. Now, man, these guys are idiots, focusing on a tiny fraction of demand in the marketplace. It's like we would reserve a seat for all of our special idiots in Washington. It's a special place, all right. According to CoreLogic data, investors bought up a quarter of all properties this year. That's a lot, but here's the issue. The majority of that buying activity was done by mom and pop investors. You know, the ones owning three to nine properties. So these bills aren't even dealing with the majority issue of the small lever of demand when it comes to housing. And we know why going after the greedy, faceless Wall Street guys is a heck of a lot easier than going after the greedy government guys. This is normally when someone would start screaming, but BlackRock, at the top of their lungs. First, it's Blackstone. That's who they mean. And I'm no longer a BlackRock, but they aren't a player in this market segment. They own minority stock positions and some of the big players, but they really don't own many single family houses. But that'd be a rather loose interpretation if we were to go after people just owning stock, right? So there are approximately 100 million houses in the United States. It's estimated that funds own 350,000 to on the high end, about 700,000 of these houses. So 0.35% to 0.7% of all houses owned in America. That's hardly enough houses to be a market mover right there. Now check this data out. The top five owners of single family houses own 317,000 units nationwide. Now I've heard politicians like RFK say that institutions will own 60% of all homes by 2030. This would mean that they would need to own 60 million houses in six years. In other words, they would need to buy 59,300,000 houses in the next six years or 9,883,333 houses per year. Now, I hate to be the guy to point out these pesky facts, but in 2023, we won't even sell 4 million units nationally. That math seems to be a little fuzzy math right there. Check this CNBC article out. I'm thinking Kennedy was trying to reference this point right here. It cites a MetLife investment management prediction that institutional investors may control 40% of U.S. single-family rental homes by 2030. Hey, Bob, that's a percentage of rental properties, not the entire housing market. And this article cites another piece of legislation, the Stop Wall Street Landlords Act 2022. Here's what I thought was interesting. The article says the prices in some Sunbelt markets have outpaced national figures for rent inflation. Between January 2020 and January 2023, rents for a two-bed detached home increased about 44% in Tampa, 43% in Phoenix, and 35% near Atlanta. Hey, 
Real quick question. If so many equity funds are buying single family houses and thereby depleting the market of sale opportunities and are then putting them on the market as a rental, how are they to blame for rental prices going up so much? I mean, your reasoning for needing this is that so many units are being pulled from the sales market to be given to the rental market. If that was true, then wouldn't that create a glut in the rental market? But rental prices are not going down. So if demand's outstripping supply on the purchase side and resulting in higher prices, but it's also doing it on the rental side as well, then wouldn't it be safe to say that we have a supply side issue, not a demand side issue? The irony of these idiots, I mean politicians, taking the tax penalty revenue and putting it into down payment assistance programs is not lost on me either. By doing this, you're only increasing demand, which will increase prices. Remember, increased demand equals increased prices. Take a look at this chart. This is Housing Start data. Notice that huge clip in 2006 and that really, really long run up to 2022. Well, it's estimated that we need roughly one and a half million housing starts per year to keep up with our population growth. Just throwing this out there, would it be safe to say that underbuilding for 10 to 13 years helped lead to this housing shortage and therefore price surge? Freddie Mac, who just may be part of the problem to high housing prices, had an interesting stat. Not only are we underbuilding houses, but take a look at what type of housing that we're building. 40% of all homes built in the 1980s were starter homes. In 2019, that number was 7%. They also cite that between 2018 and 2020, the housing supply shortage increased from 2.5 million units to 3.8 million units. That's pretty much an entire year of national housing sales. And this doesn't even begin to account for the 3 to 4 million immigrants that have entered our country and need housing in the next couple of years. The answer isn't limiting hedge funds in buying houses. If you want to do it, then fine. Do it so that you can pound your chest and say that you did something that really in the end doesn't move the needle one bit and doesn't matter. If a politician was really serious about helping people and creating an environment of housing affordability, then they would do two things. First, then cut the red tape on getting housing projects approved. Then they would create legislation that provides incentives to builders to start building more houses. These incentives most likely would be through tax deductions or credits. And the phrase there is starter houses. Maybe do a sliding scale where starter house is considered, I don't know, making up a number here, but 80% of the average sale price for a single family property in each prospective market. But in the end, these politicians aren't serious. These clouds are just in for the national headline or two. Something that makes them look good to their constituents because if they were really interested, then they would examine the real influencing factors of why we have high housing prices. You can, too, by watching this video right up here on who's to blame for high housing prices. If you're thinking about buying or selling a house, then reach out. I'd love to help. Until next time.